I am a comic book artist, writer, creator, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you on the internet. If you'd like to support this channel, get additional bonus live streams, see behind the scenes artwork as it's in progress, you can support this channel at patreon.com slash Jeremy. It's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. If you'd like to read some of my comments for free, you can check out my, uh, my newsletter. It's news.jeremy.net. And if you'd like to purchase physical copies of my comics, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. That will forward you to my Amazon author page. So I see uh, Amaris is in the chat and Amar is already in the chat. How you guys doing? It's been a hot minute. All right. So today we're doing some figure drawing. Um, for those that are new to the channel, figure drawing is a major part of my artistic growth and development. I still feel like I'm learning and studying and figuring out how to be a better artist every day. And going to figure drawing classes on a weekly basis is a big part of it. And I think one of the most important things that I've been doing that helps, and I don't do it as often as I should. Um, see, I see uh, El Gargoyle in the chat. Hail El Gargoyle. Thanks for, uh, for dropping by. Uh, Amar says he's been streaming on Twitch lately. I've heard great things about Twitch. Um, I have not set up a Twitch account, but I've watched other artists on there. They're my home base. So it doesn't mean I'll never try it or do one of those things where I'm streaming to multiple platforms at once. But for now, you know, this is home. Um, in terms of figure drawing, one of the things that helps me the most is taking drawings from class that didn't come out right and um, the things that I, I don't understand about anatomy, the, the problem areas. Because figure drawing really helps show them. And then coming back and redrawing them and trying to understand and fix and improve those things. You know, sometimes it involves breaking out an anatomy book and comparing it to my drawings. But really just sketching through and redrawing it and trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong. And these two drawings here are a great example of that. This one here on the left is the drawing that I was doing in class. And meanwhile, I see a few more, you know, little side note. I see more people showing up in the chat. I wanna make sure I at least acknowledge everybody. I see Ion Rocks is there. Um, Amaris has been using drawing with a, a new tablet. She says she, she's happy with it and, and likes it. Amar says he should get back onto YouTube periodically, but he needs to figure out a direction to pick up more viewers. Oh, Amar also asked, did I finish the Procreate illustrations? Um, I have. I've been, um, you know, I'm going to be able to upload the recordings of the process for all of those. I have, I finished three out of the five. I've finished the Queen of Hearts. I, mean, I finished the White Rabbit. The, um, these are a series of Alice in Wonderland themed illustrations. Um... I finished one and the Cheshire Cat. So I still have the Queen of Hearts and there's two Queen of Heart pieces, but they are almost done. So I will probably start uploading those, uh, those videos over the next, maybe next week or the week after that. I'll start uploading the time lapses of those. Um, and also I'm gonna make at least one of them available as a digital mobile wallpaper for people that are on my newsletter. So if you haven't already signed up for my newsletter, please do. And a link will go out um, in the next newsletter with a link to that. And for people that are subscribers to the Patreon, I'm gonna make all of them available as a as mobile wallpapers. So, so a little incentive there if you guys wanna hop onto the newsletter or hop onto the Patreon and get those, will be there once I finish the whole series. So probably in the next couple weeks. Um, Oh yeah, so I was saying, these two drawings are, are examples of me going back and trying to rework and fix and understand what I was getting wrong. So the main thing here is that the torso is doing a nice contrapposto, which is a twist where the upper torso twists to the lower, different direction than the lower torso. So you can see her shoulders are turned to the right while her hips are turned straight on, not quite to the left, but you know, it's still a pretty strong twist but it felt very disconnected in this drawing and what was happening with the fabric felt disconnected. So in me coming back and trying to redraw this, I really wanted to solidify the feeling of the shoulder. So it was really just coming in and trying to clean up the silhouette of this and make the, the shoulders feel tighter and then get the shape of the hips. And I still feel like her waist, I maybe made it a little too narrow. I mean, she was kind of a narrow-waisted model, 
but I feel like I may not have gotten quite enough of that in the effort to get the, the twist. But then trying to get that sense of the legs dropping forward and the fabric twisting, almost as if the fabric is making a connection between her hip and her knee, that you can see all of the pull lotion, but then also having her other knee that's coming in a very sh foreshortened pose with the upper leg pointing at us and then her lower leg going down and away. So trying to get all of these elements in there. And I did even get to her, her other shoulder, which again, the other shoulder was straight and then with a foreshortened, strongly foreshortened arm coming at us. So these are the kind of things that I go through and redraw just to work and figure out. So let's go through here and maybe find a couple of other drawings that really bit the dust here. And I will tell you, I had a pretty hard time this, uh, this drawing session. There was a lot of me, the class that I'm taking right now, or that I actually just finished, is about costume and drapery. Like this one is one that I'm actually fairly pleased with. And that was after doing this drawing beforehand where I didn't get very far in terms of finishing the whole gesture. And the thing is that I struggled with in this particular session is just getting the gesture right. Because you really have to understand what the figure is doing underneath the clothes in order to ap accurately have the drapery convey, you know, convey what the body's doing. So a lot of times I was just sitting there and I didn't even get very far in the drapery because I was just like, this is a challenging pose for the figure or it's just a pose that I'm not doing a very good job at. Um, I think this one right here on the left is one that I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at. It's pretty unfinished. So let me scoot this over here to the side. Grab a, a pad of newsprint. Take a sip of water. And get into this bad boy. Here, let's move this over a little bit more. I think the camera can use a little bit of adjustment as well. Let's bring this down this way. Let's see here. All right. Let's see here. Oh, I see a couple of other uh, questions in the chat there. Um, or not questions, but comments. Amara says, I have carpal tunnel syndrome, so I finally got my medical brace, and now I can draw without numbness in my hands and burning joints. That is, I'm glad to hear that you're getting treatment for that. Carpal tunnel can be uh, the bane of an artist's existence. So keeping yourself healthy and, uh, and able to keep working, make sure that you're not hurting yourself while you're making art is very important. I see Wasim is in the chat. He said, catching it live for the first time. Um, thanks for, for showing up. Glad you're here. Mm -hmm. and Wasim also has a uh, comment from Mars. He says, go to the gym you'll, and take it slow. You'll be standard how much stronger you'll become or how strong you'll become. You know, physical health. Artists, I think in general, do not take enough care with their physical health. Um, and... Leading a sedentary lifestyle, which that's the thing, when you're making art, whether it's sitting at the drawing table or being in front of the canvas, you're very sedentary for extended periods of time and your muscles get weaker. And if you don't take care of your body, you won't be able to make art. So I definitely uh, agree and co-sign on that statement, Wasim. Um, I personally, try to go cycling three times a week and I do yoga twice a week. 
And yoga, I think that whatever physical, whether it's weightlifting or go, you know, going to the gym or what have you, is important. I find that I personally just don't like getting in the car and going someplace, so I do yoga at home. I've got like a video that I do the routine, yoga routine with. And I feel that it does, you know, help strengthen my core. Definitely does a lot of good, uh, good work on both the upper body, the abs, the back, the thighs. Like it helps strengthen a lot of the things that leading a sedentary lifestyle can lead to. But you know, just regular you know, weightlifting on uh, weight machines or free weights. The, you know, it's just different ways of working the same muscles. So right now I'm just trying to block in the general body parts. And in the original drawing, I didn't, I made a big mistake in not defining what all of the limbs are doing. So I did not establish what her other arm is doing. So pretend that she's maybe sitting in a chair. Well, she's definitely sitting in a chair. That I remember. But let's say that the chair is up this way and her arm is over the, uh, the back of the chair. I'm trying to keep it simple. Because again, the point of this isn't necessarily to draw chairs, although I do need to get better environmental drawing and, and capturing things like just, you know, what's going on in the room. Yeah, I feel like in order to properly be in proportion, that chair is going to have to be a little bit more in. See, this is the reason why I sometimes ignore this stuff. It's because they get caught up in the whole, oh, well, now the chair doesn't right, look right in comparison to the body. And then I really go off from what I intended to do. But I remember one of the things that bothered me when I was drawing this model is that I had a lot of trouble drawing this wrist because her hand, her arm was coming across, very gracefully across the, the torso. And then as I reached out to her knee, her wrist, the whole arm was foreshortened. The wrist became even more foreshortened and then her hands wrapped around her knee. And that turn was very subtle, but it basically gave you the direction of the, the turn of her. Like, it helped describe the corner of her knee, but it was such a foreshortened pose that it was very difficult to put it down there. Like it looked, it made all the sense in the world visually when you look at it, but trying to put it down on paper was very subtle. It didn't make sense. So I kind of struggled with that. So you guys are gonna get to watch me struggle with that. So let's see here. For some reason, I have uh, my iPad next to me to, uh, to read questions. And the questions are not showing up on there, so I have to go up to my phone. I'm trying to not shake the, uh, the camera as I look at it. Yeah, my Wi-Fi doesn't reach all the way back here. Um, so I have to go back up here and look at this to see the comments. And I have to move this camera down a little bit more because I'm craning my neck to see you guys. All right. So in terms of the carpal tunnel, um, Amaris says uh, she's still recovering from uh, breaking the same hand with carpal tunnel, but she she gets it. She go she gonna work on it. Um. Oh, Kenzuart is a new subscriber, and he says, I'm liking your gestures. First off, thank you for subscribing. Thank you for, for showing up and spending time here. Um, I hope you enjoy. Um, and thanks for the kind words about the drawing. Let's see here. Right. Lots of kind words and support for Amaris in her recovery. Um, hi to Jinx. And I, I, again, every time you're on, I always apologize for not understanding how to pronounce your name. So if there's a way you can put it phonetically in the chat so I understand it, I will try. I know that I'm butchering it and not getting at all close. 
because there's no vowels in the uh, the name. Um, but he asked, are you using a B pencil? And I'm actually using a 4B. I have, um, I usually buy like a box at a time and I don't like buying them online because sometimes if they drop the box and all the pencils are cracked, but there aren't as many good art stores close to me that have them. So I'm using a General's 4B charcoal and I'm using it inside of a, a pencil holder. So separately, they sell these pencil holders that, um, like, this is how much pencil there is left. It doesn't need to be right next to there. So it's just a tiny little nub of a pencil compared to, uh, like, this isn't even, this one is even worn down a bit. They're even a little bit longer. And they're brand new fresh. But you can see how little of the pencil there is left. And it would be very hard to just be drawing with this tiny little thing and be pinching with your hands. So you just, you know, pencil extenders, you can find them online. You can find them at Michael's or most art supply stores. I'm sure if you've got a Hobby Lobby near you, they probably have them. And it's just a little tube. Slide your pencil in. There's a little ring at the, at the, uh, at the neck. It tightens it to hold it in place. And now you've got a nice long pencil from a tiny one. So, let's see here. And let me know if you have any other questions. If anybody else in the chat has questions as we go, please feel free to jump in. Amar mentions that he, um, he finally finished another piece of promo art and needs to do two more. He's about to start his next issue of his comic next month. And he thinks he'll take the movie release uh, post. Uh, post um, pro, ah, movie release approach. And I shall refer to Mr. H as Mr. H. So I will, I will try to make a point to remember that you're Mr. H, but thank you again, because you always make very thoughtful comments and ask interesting questions. And I love to at least not acknowledge people in the chat. So, so thank you for that, and thanks for the questions. And thank you for watching. Um, and Amar says uh, his goal is to finish at least three to four comics. Um, are you saying that that's three to four comics per year that you're going to do? Because that is impressive it's a it's an aggressive schedule and i have always wanted to get i've always felt like if i could do four issues per year then that means i can do a graphic novel a year so that's always been my goal and the best i've ever done the entire year well it was like two and a half i finished one i made a lot of finished two and made a lot of progress on the third one but i've still never been able to get up to uh to even three a year so I think that, you know, obviously you should keep going for that goal. I've gotten to the point now where I realize, as opposed to driving myself crazy, to simply accept what I'm capable of doing and focus focus really on just producing the best comics possible. Because one of the things I noticed is I would alternate between trying to make an issue the best I possibly could and then just trying to finish an issue as quickly as possible. And during the year where I got two and a half issues done, I was drawing much faster, but there were a lot of things that in the end I was not happy with just because I was rushing. And I've come to the point now where I realize hopefully I will get faster over time, but I'd rather try and draw a book that I'm not trying to be perfect because as uh, Jake Parker says, um, perfect is the enemy of good. But I do want each issue to be something I'm proud of. So I have actually slowed down a bit. But that's really in terms of finishing Morningstar. Now that I'm close to the end of this series, wow, I am drawing this, uh, this figure model, like Kirby's fourth world. And she is definitely narrower than that. I've really, like I think, exaggerated her hips and her thighs. This is probably a bit over the top in comparison to what her actual anatomy was, because she was actually kind of a slender model. Um, it's just that this twist really accented her thighs. You know what though? Screw it. It's something that I noticed and I'm making a note of mentally that I would like to correct in future drawings is being better at capturing not just the gesture and not just the anatomy, but the physical structure of the model, whether they are 
um, you know, broader, leaner, longer, like getting some of their physical characteristics in as well as the, uh, the proportions. So I'm noting the fact that there's one particular element of this model that I didn't get or didn't capture, but I think that, again, I will take forever in this study if I go back and try to capture those things as well. So for now, I want to focus just on getting the, uh, the physical anatomy closer to what was really going on there. Let's see. Ah, all right. The live stream refreshed on my iPad. So let me see some questions here. Okay, so first Mr. H asks, can I explain how to use a B pencil because I have problems with it? I use an H pencil for sketches. Well, the point of using a soft pencil is for drawing with tones. Let me see here. This pencil is a, a, uh, a 4H. And the H, for those who don't know, pencils come in different levels of hardness and softness. The higher the number of H, you know, it goes from, there's an HB, which is in the middle. It's kind of medium soft, medium hard. And there's 2H, 4H, 6H. Um, I want to say there might be an 8H. I don't remember, but I feel, I feel like they do go to eights, but generally it's um, six, the generally most places you can find um, anywhere from 6B, which is generally the most softest, to uh, a 6H, which is generally the hardest. I do believe that there is a, an 8H and an 8B as well. Um, but the point being, so this is a hard pencil and it gives you a very sharp line. It's great for refining and doing tight details and crisp things, but when you try to draw like a tone, you can get a tone there, but it's kind of scratchy. It's not a soft painterly tone. The idea of using a, a, a B, a soft pencil, is that it's kind of like, it would be an exaggeration to say that it's like oil painting, but in drawing with pencils, it is kind of an it's an equivalent in the sense that you can get a broad, soft, liquidy tone. Like with this 4B, I can make a, a nice broad tone with the side of the pencil and I can make it really darkle tone. I mean, just like this, I can, I can kind of sculpt a volume out of this just using tones. The difference is that if you were to try to do this with say a, um, an H, a 2H, a 4H, you would have to come in there and build up those values or even if you're using the side of your pencil, like <clears throat> you can see how much work I have to do just to get something that's a little bit dark. You really have to work in there. <clears throat> so the point of using an H pencil is for making, you could do an entire outline and block in a figure very lightly in, in a, with, a, with an H or a 2H or 4H or harder pencil, and then come in and use a softer pencil, a B, for doing your rendering and your shadows and for for modeling form, for doing, basically, let's say that I draw a circle with a, uh, with a, you can probably barely see that. That's because it's a, it's an H, it's 4H. And then you can actually say, all right, so it's a circle. How do you turn a circle into a sphere? meaning a three-dimensional object. And that's when you can come in with a softer pencil, right, a mid-tone, a half-tone, core shadow, a little bit of reflected light at the bottom. So that might be a good way to think about it, is, um, First off, it's really a matter of comfort and what you enjoy using. Um, I wouldn't really use any H's for figure drawing only because you need to have, you need to be able to do a, a quicker range of values. And you can do very light drawings with, um, with a soft pencil, a B or a 4B. 
Um, so the difference is you can go much darker with this much quicker as opposed to the, the H's. But in general, there's no reason why if you're just doing your own personal work and it's not necessarily drawn quickly, there's no reason why you can't use two different pencils or three different pencils in the same drawing. You can do your rough layouts with a hard pencil, do your rendering and modeling with say like a 2B and then do like really dark shadows with a 6B. You can use all of those pencils in, in one drawing. There's no, I, I know that we all wanna find that one magic tool to do something, but there's a reason why there's pencilers and different effects. You can use two different tools in the same drawing. You can use two different types of pencils um, in fact, I think a lot of people that work traditionally as if their main artwork is drawing with a capital D, then if they finish drawings. They probably use like two, maybe like an one H, two different Bs, plus maybe a white pencil for highlights. <clears throat> they use a variety in, in one drawing. So don't feel restricted that you have to use it. Um, a lot of time, just experiment, try stuff out and see how you like it. Um, hopefully that answers your questions. If you have a follow-up to that, then then please let me know. But hopefully that's useful. Let me swing back to the chat here real quick and see if uh, there's any more questions. So, Amar says that um, that he he needs to do more in the following years in terms of finishing his uh, his comics. Uh, I know the feeling. It is rough. I am, like I said, I've been slowing down with uh, with Morningstar, but at the same time, I am planning. I'm thinking about for my next comic book to try and do something that is intentionally looser. Um, and I think the challenge is to do something that's loose but still expresses what I I wanted to. So what I've been looking at is some of the older. Um, I've been looking at some Dave McKean comics. And Dave McKean is mostly known for his beautiful co covers for, uh, for Sandman, for illustrating children's books. But one of my favorite comics is a book that he did called Cages. And it's sort of a, a metaphysical, poetic contemplation on like life and creativity. Um, I think it covers a lot of the same ground. If you ever read the last volume of Kabuki... I can't remember the name of it, but the last volume of Kabuki is really just about the character figuring out her sense of purposivity. Um, I would put those two books very much in the same uh, same category in terms of content. But Dave McKean is somebody who can obviously draw and paint and photograph and sculpt and do all these amazing things. Um, and it's a multimedia book. He uses a lot of different media in it. But the reason why I cite it is because a lot of the comic book passages are very specifically not painted. They're actually done in just very loose, expressive ink with maybe a little bit of a, a second color tone. And I think that if I can find a way to do an approach that's that immediate and expressive that I'm happy with, that may allow me to work faster. So I think I want to go back and forth. Like I'm saying, I'm trying to go slower with finishing up Morningstar because I want it to be the way that I want, but that doesn't mean I'm just going to be like, all right, I'm going to be slow and I'm going to publish an issue a year for the rest of my life. No, I still want to be able to publish more comics, but I don't want to do it at the uh, the cost of my own emotional well-being and stress myself out so much that I don't really enjoy this because I want to enjoy it. Because I love comics. Um, see what else is going on in the chat. Oh, Mr. H also says uh, finding uh, art supplies in Argentina is, is difficult. Um, that is is unfortunate. I I've never been to Argentina, but you know, I guess the, well, the only advice I can give you is that if you can afford it, when you do find art supplies or tools that you like is maybe to try and buy in bulk. Maybe they'll, you'll get a better deal and you can say, all right, I'm gonna get all the pencils I'm gonna need for like a year and then I'm not, if I make it back to this particular art store, then I, I'll be okay for a good long time. Plus, you know, obviously finding tools that you can use that are 
that are easy to get to. I mean, for, there, I know a lot of people that do amazing artwork in ballpoint pen, and they like ballpoint pen. They've learned to draw on it, and that's just what they enjoy. But there's also people who, they just use what they were, what's available to them. And so there's people who do great work in ballpoint pen because that's what they, they've always loved working in. There's some people who do it because they're like, look, that's what I can afford, and that's what's available to me. So, um... <clears throat> If it, when it comes to say using a uh, a B versus an HB or a or an H pencil, you know, if all you have are are uh, harder pencils, then maybe you use some watercolor to supplement that and do pencil and watercolor for for doing the rendering instead of doing it in um doing the rendering with a with a softer pencil. There's no reason you can't go mixed medium. Um, and it also depends whether you're trying to do finished artwork with a certain look or whether it's just about studying. Because if it's just about studying and being able to draw the form, um, I mean, I do these studies with charcoal pencil because that's what I've found is useful for figure drawing classes. But the very simple number two pencil, the Dixon Ticonderoga. This pencil is an actual HB. It, I, you know, it says that on there in terms of the lead hardness. These are the things that, I'm not sure if people around the world use them, but in the United States, this is like the dominant pencil that every school child uses. And I still use these as an adult when I'm doing my comp books, when I do uh, my layouts and I'm cleaning them up. That's still the, the base tool that I use because I've been drawing with it for so many years. I'm very comfortable with it. In terms of drawing this model, I don't know if I've actually really refined or fixed or improved anything. I've made her definitely much broader in the shoulders than she was in the class. And I haven't even drawn any uh, fabric onto her yet. So I guess instead of belaboring this, I think I'm going to try and speed through throwing fabric on here and then move on to another drawing. So let's see. Let me look at the, some more comments in the chat. Oh, Amar asks if I, if I finished drawing the, uh, the cover that I was working on um, in Affinity Photo. <coughs> Let's see, I'm trying to remember. You know what? I don't think I did. I think I paused working on that cover while I was, um, while I was started the Wonderland series. And I actually need to go back and open Affinity Photo and take a look at it and see if it's done. And it's funny because if I had to do it over again, I honestly don't want to finish an Affinity Photo. I've enjoyed drawing in Procreate so much, I think I'd almost rather port it over port over whatever I have, import the layers into Procreate and finish it that way. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, Amar says, I will take the animation approach. I know um, 1,440 frames is equal to one minute animation, which is equal to 280 to 288 to 300 pages of comics. Well, that's, damn, you've got the, the math worked out. I'm like, go for it. Go with your bad self. He says, which means I could get five books of 60 pages done in one to two months. That's the speed I'm eventually shooting for. He says, once I can complete a full minute of animation in a month with backgrounds, the sky's the limit. That's a, that's a, that's an amazing pace, man. I, I admire and envy you. That's a, That's pretty awesome. Look forward to seeing how that comes out. I think for me, the slowing down has come really from me being, I don't want to say nitpickier. Well, you know what it is? It's nitpick well, that's the thing. It's not really nitpicky because I can look at my drawings and generally see when I'm going really fast, the places where I'm all, this is poor. This is not as good as it should be. Um, I know that I can draw better. And it's more of me trying to learn how to keep the pace that I want 
while delivering the level of quality that I want. And even though perfect is the enemy of good, I still want to be good. So that's the, uh, the I think the, the challenge that I have in terms of speed is that the more I learn, the more dis- I think that's that's true of everyone. And I am very encouraging of people, and you know I always talk about not beating yourself up. That said, the more that I learn in art, the less satisfied I am with my own art. Now that isn't like, oh, I hate my art, it sucks. It's just, I feel like, as I see more of what art is capable of, I realize all the places where I'm not pushing my work to the level of quality that it could be. And I try to, I'm trying to find a nice balance between making my work as good as I, I it can possibly be and making it something that I can produce in a timely manner. I probably wanted to say more about that in a more refined way, but then I started focusing on drawing these folds. Because now I'm actually now I'm actually thinking like, all right, how much of these folds do I need to put in to convey what's happening here with this leg coming forward? And I realize that now I'm not drawing what we actually could see in the model. I'm making decisions about this. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use the fabric as a cross contour. And for those of you who don't know, a cross contour is, let's say I draw this thigh, for instance. I'll just draw it out here in space. Now, it just looks like a stretched out egg. A cross con now a contour is the outline of a drawing. The cross contour is kind of like the wireframe of a 3D model where it shows you what is going across the cr contour. Now, I could draw lightly through it, it's almost like I'm drawing a cross section. But let's say that I wish I'd made this a little bit more foreshortened because it really, I think, brings it home when you, you have a really foreshortened figure. But the idea of the cross contour is that it now gives you that sense of an object coming towards you in space. These are pretty shitty contours, but that's because I was trying, as I was doing it, to try and make it look more foreshortened. Realistically, what I think I wanted was something like this. I, mean, I know it looks kind of like a larva now, but my idea, what I really wanted was to give you that sense of foreshortening just by the sense of these lines going across it. So it feels like this one is coming more towards the viewer. Now, you can apply this to drapery. In a way, if you place the folds in the right place, you're not just describing what the cloth is doing, but you're also describing that it is wrapping around in kind of concentric, not concentric circles, but in receding circles, I'm trying to convey that. In the folds, it's challenging, and sometimes see this is this is where I get myself. This is why I get my ass in trouble, trying to draw and talk at the same time. There's times when I'm drawing stuff and I'm like, wait, I really actually. Like I may be sitting here talking about whatever and art and creativity and process and encouragement and not beating yourself up and all of a sudden I'm drawing something I'm like, oh wait, I re Again, not finishing this arm. But just enough to get the idea that her hand is kind of touching her face. I still don't feel like I got what I wanted out of this wrist because for one, her hand wrapped a little bit further around, like it was just placed a little bit more around the side and her fingers wrapped around a little bit more. Like the same way that her torso, her upper body is turned away 
and her lower body is turned more towards you. This wrist, the hand was coming across her wrist, like curving around that knee. And it's just, it's so subtle. These little subtle things of energy. This is the reason why sometimes you'll end up like just doing like five drawings of just a wrist to get that right. Um, but yeah, let's move on to a, a different, you know what? Screw it. Since we're here, I'm just going to work on this wrist for a little while. I know I was drawing drapery. I'm tempted to move on to another drawing. That needs to be corrected. But I want to take one more shot at just doing a study of just this wrist. Um, if you guys say, you know what, move on to another drawing. If you comment in the chat and you want me to move on, I'll move on. I'm going to take one more stab at this wrist. Um, meanwhile, let me take a look at comments in the chat. Let's see. Oh, I see Morris King is in the chat. He says, happy Black History Month, my king. Thank you. I appreciate it, my fellow king. We're appreciate, we're, you know, celebrating the black arts here on, uh, on YouTube this month. So thank you. I appreciate that. I see program gay pictures in the chat. Sorry it took me a while to get to you guys. Um, thanks for, uh, for popping in. Um, Amar says, overthinking and perfection will kill progress instantly. I think the artist who finishes things faster has to come to peace with where, um, come to peace at where they're at. You are very right. And I think that's the interesting thing. I talk a good game about being calm and, and patient with myself and just being nonchalant about where my art is. But I am genuinely not satisfied. I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm doing figure drawing studies. I'm really not satisfied with where my art is at. Um, but I say that in the, the sense of really just wanting to grow. It's because I want my work to be beautiful and better. It's not a self-loathing. It's more of I simply aspire to do more, to express more beauty in the world. There's more beauty in the world than I'm capable of drawing right now, and I want to contribute more to it. So if I can make that sound at all somewhat upbeat as opposed to me just being... Mm. Yeah, Amar says they can work on their flaws when they have time to, which again, this is me taking time to work on my flaws as opposed to me just drawing my comic or drawing those, uh, those pieces. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's uh, sharing that when I can. Um, Pro Game Fixer says, uh, can you check my friend's drawing? Um, post it in the, a link to it in the chat. If I can uh, take a look at it, then uh, I'm sure. So let's see, this knee. You know, although that, that comment uh, about checking your friend's drawing, really, here's the thing about giving people critiques of their work. People need to come with specific questions. You can't just say, look at my drawing. What's well, like, well, what do you want to do with it? Because if you're somebody who's looking to do a cartooning, like a webcomic, the advice I would give to somebody who wants to do a webcomic is very different than the advice of somebody who do comics versus wants to do concept design. Um, I'll tell you, I personally don't even think that I'm qualified to give people a lot of critique in terms of concept design because it's something that I myself am still working very much to improve on. Um, I would say what I'm good at assessing is figure drawing, mainly because I'm assessing my own work all the time, um, not because I'm a master figure drawer. But I think figure drawing and storytelling narrative work those are things that i can be useful in expressing but you know most people i think a lot of times they ask for critiques and they haven't even taken the time to ask themselves what's wrong with their work um that's one of the things that i i try to spend a lot of time with is actually analyzing my own work and saying what's wrong with it and developing the i your own internal self-criticism is probably one of the most important skills an artist can have. So if they don't necessarily have that, that would be something I would tell your friend is, what do they think is wrong with their work? What do they want out of a critique? And that's the first thing I think you need. Whenever you go and ask someone else for a critique, 
you should have a question in your mind already of what do I want? What do I want out of this? I mean, if you're just saying I want to be a better artist, um, I mean, someone can just sit there and point out flaw, flaws all day long. I mean, everything, there's some artists who have work that is very flawed, but it's beautiful and ex it's expressive. And you wouldn't want to tell somebody, get rid of this, change that, because those flaws are what make them unique. You look at someone like Egon Schiele, um, he's a beautiful painter. Uh, here, let me write that down here for those of you that want to do a little art study. I believe it's S-H-I-E-L-E. I believe that is how you spell his name. Um, some people pronounce it Sheila, but um, I've just heard, I've heard to say Egon Sheila, Egon Sheila, but um, he's a European artist. I want to say um, mid-19th century. Um, but anyway, go look up his work. He's somebody who is super loose and rough and expressive. Um, and he draws a lot of, of nudes. And, um, but he's not somebody, he's somebody who if you just put him in a figure drawing class, you might be very critical of his academic drawing per se, but you wouldn't want to change his work because it's his looseness and roughness that makes it so beautiful. So that's something you should probably keep in mind in terms of like asking you know, for feedback, is what do you want out of that feedback? Because you ask the wrong person, someone will just tell you, well, do this, this, and this. That may not be right for what you want to get out of your work. All right, so I'm just sort of blocking in this knee here. Now, trying to capture what was going on with the wrist. I'm gonna erase a little bit of this here. Let's see. Oh, Pro Gamer says that his friend, it's a drawing counter Reeves. Morse Lee says that's deep. I you know, I think we're just talking about the, the general approach to philosophy and, and art together. Thank you, I appreciate that. Iron Rocks says great show. And uh Pro Gamer, Pro Game Fixers uh cosigns. see here there's the comet michelangelo i'm not sure what that's in reference to this sometimes people can't see their own flaws because they live in a world where constructive criticism is looked at as hate also most times when you're getting critiqued by people who are not real students of art you're all very 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 true um and plus, there's people who sometimes are trying to give constructive criticism, but they are not particularly tactful. They don't know how to express crit criticism in an encouraging way. It is very easy for criticism to simply sound like someone saying, you are not good. Um, I think that there is an art to delivering criticism in a manner which is inspiring excuse me, inspiring and encouraging and informative. That's the, that's the other thing is, is it actually productive? Is it actually saying, take this step to work on this problem? Like for me, I feel like I have many, there are many flaws in my drawings in general. And the specific step of taking figure drawings from class and redrawing them is an analytical tool For me, looking at the things that I'm not happy with. I mean, that's that's the first thing is being able to look at your drawings, and if something is out of doesn't look right, being able to say, well, what's wrong with it? That's the first step is diagnostic. Being able to say, what is wrong with this drawing? Not just oh, I don't like it. Oh, it sucks. To literally say, to go from the the general of this drawing isn't good to the specific of this arm is too long, this leg is too short, these eyes are too far apart. That's the first thing, is being able to actually diagnose the artwork. Once you develop that skill, then you can say, all right, well, what would happen if I were to do this drawing exactly again and get it right? And redrawing your bad drawings 
I think is a way of developing that diagnostic skill. Because if you, even if you don't know what's wrong with your drawing, you just know that you're not happy with it, in your mind, you have a version of that drawing that is good, that, that it says everything that you want it to express. So if you were to go back and take a drawing that you feel is unsuccessful, that you're not happy with, that's what I'm doing right now, and just draw it again and try to do it better, what will happen is you may still not get that drawing right. You may only have two versions of a crappy drawing. But if you look at those two different versions, you can say, well, it's not. Is it worse in different ways? Did I just do a carbon copy of the same drawing or is it different? And when you can compare the differences between one bad drawing and, a, and another second attempt at that same bad drawing, then you can start saying, all right, what did I do differently? Did I make things longer? Did I make things shorter? Um, are the muscles actually connecting together properly? Um, does the anatomy actually feel like it is volumetric, like it exists in 3D space? You can start comparing those drawings. And once you start comparing them, then you do maybe a third drawing or a fourth drawing. Like, look, I'm doing just a copy, just of a hand bending around a knee. And I don't necessarily have the time to do it today, but with something like this, I feel like I'm getting a little bit closer to what I wanted. If I were really serious about fixing this particular problem, I would probably ask my wife to take this similar pose and then take a photograph of her in the pose so that I have photo reference to work from, then I can compare the photo reference with my drawings. Um, now again, that's gonna be challenging just in terms of getting my wife into a pose that is similar to the pose the model took because the model was doing something very, very specific with her body and that very specific thing is what I'm trying to get. And if I'm having a hard time getting it in the drawing, I think it would also be difficult to instruct someone else on how to take that pose. I mean, that's what makes professional models professional. They, they have a great understanding of their own. If you, can, maybe if you can convey to them a mood or a feel, an angle, an anatomical thing, they can internalize that and say, is this what you mean? No, a little shorter, twist a little bit more. They, they can, they're very in tune with that. Um, which is again, one of the reasons why I love going to figure drawing classes. Point being is that it's very difficult to coach someone who is not a professional model into doing those things. So the main thing I was trying to do here in this little diagram is convey a little bit more of that arm swooping across and the other thing I realize I'm failing on here is I'm not getting as much of the foreshortening. Like the same way I did here, you can also do foreshortening with, uh, with tone and just giving the sense of where the muscles are, giving just a little bit of shade to make it feel like it's moving and twisting across the form. This drawing is better but this in order to get this right I think I really would need to uh, have a model posed and study just that hand and what it's doing so I could drive myself nuts dry, drawing that all day long let's see what's going on in the chat Let's see, <laughs> Morris says, preach, Amar. Um, Pro Game Fixers um, says he's unable to send a link. Um, he says it's a true art tutorial stream. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. that, that's very kind of you. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm just rambling about art as I'm making it, but I feel like that's the thing people don't necessarily get to see. Like when they see a finished artist making this perfect piece, they say, do this, do this, do that. And oh, it's awesome. But I don't necessarily see a lot of the blind alleys, the having to redraw things, nail stuff out. Or even when you, just in terms of a composition, just even choosing to draw a certain pose or a certain object, the amount of work that goes into doing the thumbnails beforehand to choose just the right thing so that when you do demo it, 
people are like, oh, he knows exactly what he's doing. It's like, well, maybe there was a lot of prep work before even getting to choosing to do that item. That does not mean that there are not artists out there that can just sit and spontaneously draw something beautiful no matter what it is, just lay it for them and they'll show you this is how to make this awesome. Those people are creative geniuses. My channel is for people who are not geniuses because I am not a genius. I am showing the drawing I do. I'm doing dozens of crappy ones and I'm kind of showing, I feel like I'm trying to, showing the hard work behind it reveals, um, demystifies the process. So Amar says you can also use an art mannequin or 3D models if you have access to those tools. Um, Mr. H asks if I have a Discord. Um, there is a Discord for my Patreon. Um, I'm not particularly active on it. More often than not, the best way, really, if you want to follow me, um, on my Patreon, you don't actually have to be a subscriber to Patreon to see all of the posts. Um, I mean, to see some of the posts. There are posts that are Patreon exclusive, but there's a lot of stuff that I post there and I just release them a week early for patrons. You can still see a lot of the stuff I have there. Um, actually, if you sign up for my newsletter, it'll have links to all of my social media. Because I post to Twitter and Instagram pretty regularly. Um, and you can always DM me there. Um, yeah, I, actually, that's something I need to do. Is I've been meaning to revamp my newsletter a little bit in terms of making it so that people can just, at any time they get a newsletter, it'll have links to all the different places to follow me online. If you want to just communicate, um, see what I'm up to, see how I'm working. But yeah, I'm usually throughout most of the week, I'm just sharing whatever I'm working on. Let's see here. And I think the, uh, the comment uh, Amar made about 3D models is, very, is a very good comment. The challenge for me is simply, uh, it's simply that, again, trying to get a human body to do something that's very subtle is it's just as challenging to get a human body to do something, to do a 3D, I think it would be hard to get a 3D model to do the exact same thing that a human body is doing. The human body is, is doing very, very subtle things and I think that that's probably a lot harder even to get the technology to do this. Just a slight little twist and stretch and all these little things. Um, so I'm not saying that it's a bad suggestion. It's a great suggestion. I just don't know if I'd be able to get that work out of it. Oddly enough, as I'm going through here, I'm finding some gesture drawings that I'm pretty pleased with. So it's hard for me to find. Oh, here's a good one. This drawing came out like crap. I would say both of these are not particularly good. I need to raise the camera up a little bit. We are almost at an hour. So maybe I'll just do a quick, a quickie here. Do a quick hit, come at this. This one here, just the pose in general is wonky. Um, honestly, redrawing it quickly, I don't know if it's really gonna do much good because I feel like it's a pose that even redrawing it quickly is still gonna be pretty off base. I mean, the problem is that there was some foreshortening going on that I did not capture. Um, the costume is like furry sleeves that made it hard to establish the foreshortening in terms of bringing in specific volumes. But I'll give it a try. Um, something else for my, uh, my Patreon subscribers. I have a series I do on there. I do a Patreon exclusive YouTube live stream and I call it um, the, uh, the art book study group where I also study from, uh, from drawing books and I just share my process of like going through and breaking down the drawings in there. And I've been doing Walt Reed's The Figure. Um, you know, it's a great book on figure drawing. And I, you know, today, later this afternoon, I'm always saying I'm not doing it for sure because it just depends when I finish my stream, I'm gonna go have a bite to eat, spend a little time with the family and see how the rest of my afternoon looks. Um, I wish I were better at scheduling 
these things so that people could always know I'm going to be doing this at this time and this date. Because I feel like that actually is something I would, I would like for subscribers to know so they can actually hang out and participate and ask questions if they want to. But my goal is to get that up either later to, to, to broadcast that for Patreon subscribers only either later today or sometime this week in the evening. So for those that are on Patreon, keep an eye out for that. So one of the things that was challenging for this pose was the nice, I mean, contrapposto is, if you can do it, if you can express it well, it looks beautiful. But the challenge is just, it's like drawing a perfect circle. When people all the time say, like, I couldn't draw a straight line. I'm like, well, that's why there's rulers. You know, drawing a perfect circle is harder than it looks. And I would say also contrapposto, getting that nice, elegant twist it is a simple task, which is not necessarily easy to pull off. Now it could be that I'm making it more difficult than it needs to be. I've been noticing that a lot lately. Some of the things that I say, oh, well, I have problems with this, I have problems with that. I'm like, no, the problem is that I'm just making it harder than it needs to be. If I can break it down into its simplest, most basic steps, and just execute those steps, this doesn't need to be hard. So with this contrapasto, that is kind of what I'm going for, is trying to break this down into something a little bit simpler. So I guess at this point, I'm just trying to really block in very simply the volumes, hand, the feet, the legs. Now see, here is the thing. This shoulder was kind of out and then it swings across the, uh, the torso. And that's, that's a very simple swing is what I was having uh, trouble with. And I feel like if I really want to express this better, now I'm sort of moving away from what was actually happening. Cause I really did feel like the, uh, the hand, I was looking down and checking. There was a seam running down the middle of uh, the, uh, the costume in the front. Kind of like the linea alba that runs down the, the middle of the torso and the hand kind of lined up with it. But it makes a better silhouette and communicates better if I move it so that her hand is breaking the outline, the silhouette of her uh, her torso. And that's actually one of the things that I have uh, trouble with in figure drawing class. Is uh, my instructor Carl Ganas very much tells us not to copy the model, but to express the story that the model is is conveying. And there's times when I'm drawing stuff and I'm trying to capture what the model is doing and I don't necessarily take the liberty to say, all right, I'm going to change this because it makes drawing look better. I think that's uh, knowing when to try and capture what the model is doing versus trying to make a good story That's something that takes, I think it takes skill, it takes time, and it takes doing it wrong. Sometimes you just have to do it and see whether it works. Sometimes you do it and you're like, oh, that was a good decision. Sometimes you do it and you're just like, no, this just looks like a shitty drawing of something that is not what the model was doing. I'm gonna change the direction So this was sort of like a, uh, a furry coat sleeve type jacket the model was wearing. And I kind of want to use those. You know, not drawing photorealistic fur, but 
but just trying to use those marks to give me that sense of foreshortening. And also it was puffier. That's the other thing, big puffy furry sleeves. Puffy is hard to uh, do foreshortening with. It's almost like she had clouds on her arms. And I have to tell you, if I had thought in class, oh, she's got clouds on her arms. Believe it or not, that thought of approaching the figure and the sleeve in that manner may have made it easier for me. So, you know, just goes to show, sometimes you don't figure stuff out till way later. And I'm changing the direction that are toward contrapposto. Shoulder up here, collarbone. And usually I try to finish all of the uh, the main elements of the figure, the head, the limbs, before I go in and put the detail into that arm that I, I did. Normally I try to get everything blocked out before that. I just sort of fell into a, a rabbit hole there. I even, didn't even finish what the arm was doing in this original drawing, so I'm just gonna have to make it up. So I am getting ready to wrap it up here. If anybody else has any uh, questions before we wrap it up, let me know. Mr. H says there was a channel in YouTube that used to have figure drawing classes, but the models were naked. Um, so YouTube didn't monetize it. They moved to daily motion. Um, oh yeah, Crocus Cafe. I didn't even know that they weren't on YouTube anymore. I have for a long time recommended people check out Crocus Cafe. Um, didn't know that they weren't on. I don't know why people have a problem with nudity for educational purposes. I feel like looking at figure drawings, looking at, uh, models and artwork, it's not... It's not sexualized. It's for the, the craft of, of drawing. First off, it's for the craft of expressing art, learning how to draw better. And secondly, even if, I think that there is some, I think there is artistic value to artwork, even if it is somewhat sexualized. Let's say in terms of like someone taking a pose that's, you know, kind of sexy and just kind of looking at you over the shoulder with, um, you know, making eyes at you. That there is artistic value and merit to that. Um, a tasteful nude, as it were. There's an art exhibit that I want to go to, but it's in San Diego and I'm in LA, so it's kind of like finding the time to drive down there is hard. But there's an artist named uh, um, Adolf uh, William Bouguereau. He's a French artist. He's an amazing realist painter. And his stuff is so, so beautiful and, and lush. And he does a lot of nude. They're, they're very beautiful. And they're tasteful. Um, and it seems weird to me that someone like him, yeah, you can look up Bougarou, because there's slideshows of his work on YouTube. Um, he's somebody I'm like, that's when I think of like doing work that can be tasteful, but still have a, a, a titillating element to it. That's somebody I think of. And I don't think that his work, his goal even was to do work that would be considered titillating. It's just, it's, uh, it's very lush and beautiful and they're nudes and you can't help but it feels like it's passionate as opposed to just being about sex, but sort of like the passion of, of life and beauty and celebrating that beauty in all of its forms. So this is me trying to redraw this drawing. Um, change the pose a little bit. Um, for, my goal really was, but I realized what I was trying to convey in terms of the, the body twisting, it really works much better if the twist is, is more. I kind of simplified what's going on with her hips. 
the proportions are a little bit wonky and out of whack. Um, I think that her left leg that's kneeling could use a little too directly behind it so that the foot is dropping down. So all of the foreshortening that would be going on was behind this. So that's why I didn't really focus on it. But, you know, this, just the act of taking a bad drawing and then redrawing it, not just once, because, I mean, you saw, I did this at the end of the YouTube, at the end of the live stream. You know, I spent, what, maybe 10 minutes on this drawing compared to all of the other stuff I was doing. You could just take a drawing and let's say you spend 10 minutes, let's say you spend a half hour and you redraw it three times. And each time you say, well, let me fix this problem. Let me fix that problem. And then on the third drawing, you're combining everything you've learned and then you're actually like, oh, wait, now I'm starting to see what this could be like. Like you might have to redraw something three or four times before you actually are able to do a final drawing that really feels like it's expresses everything you want Everything is anatomically correct um, and expresses the, the story, the vision that you want. And that's one of the things I want to convey to you is that it's not like you just draw something and then it's either it's good or it's bad and it's done. In order to make the level of artwork that I think most people aspire to, for a lot of us, it really is drawing it over and over and over again until we can fix those things and, and get it, uh, get it to the, the level that we want. It's not just it comes out of your hand and it's magically beautiful. And the people who can do that are people who've been doing it for so many... They've already, they've already done those drawing it over and over again. Most of them have done it enough times now that they can draw it really good on the first try. So, last couple of comments. Um, so, uh, Amar says he, uh, he knew what you was talking about in terms of Crocus Cafe. The videos are still on YouTube. Um, the models have to get paid, and yeah, I think it's a great idea too. Um, thousand subs with only 46 videos. I have over 250, have not come anywhere close. Um, that's a nut, and you forgot to crack. Well, you know what? There's all sorts of um, YouTube channels on there about social media and how to get subscribers, but I realize that most of those things involve me not doing what I want to do, which is draw comics, do figure drawings, and share that process. So, I mean, I'm definitely open to critique and, uh, and advice in terms of other things that I can do to make my channel grow. But in the end, if the only point is to have a large subscriber base, but I'm not doing the thing that I wanna do, if I'm not making the art that I wanna make, then it's, it's like I'm having a subscriber base, but they're not here for what I wanna do. So what's the point? Um, I think that there's a middle ground between doing things that are practical as a creative person and promoting yourself versus doing the work that you're passionate about. So when you talk about that being a nut you need to crack, I am right there with you. And on that note, guys, thank you all for joining me. Like I said, if you're, uh, if you're on Patreon, or if you want to see that, uh, that, uh, that art book live stream that I'm going to do either later today or this week, um, please go to patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. You can sign up for as little as two bucks a month. You know, whatever you feel comfortable. Um, to support this channel, you'll get to see a whole bunch of bonus content. In fact, guys, even if you're not gonna subscribe to Patreon, go over to Patreon and you can follow artists. You can create an account where you're not paying any money to anyone and you can just find, you can just follow people and you'll see Patreon allows you to post um, subscriber only posts and it also allows you to post public posts so you guys can see all the stuff that i do that's public on there you know even if you're not paying for it so please go over there and check it out and there's tons of great artists on patreon as well um again my newsletter news.jeremy.net you'll get a, a feed it's kind of my greatest hits of each month of what i post on social media so you can keep up with it i also post pages for my comic morning star and Amazon.jeremy.net. If you'd like to buy a physical copy or if you read comics digitally, you get it on Amazon Kindle as well. So, all right, guys, thank you so much for spending time. Mr. H, I'm glad you gave me a, a name to call you by. Thank you so much for interacting. Um, Lamar, thank you again for all the great comments. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Guys, that's it for now. Go be creative.